Well, thanks everyone for joining us tonight for the lecture. Um, and thanks as always to um, Tremco, who you may or may not know is our partner in sponsoring lectures um, focused on sustainable practice um, for a number of years now here at Roger Williams. Five years. Five? I'm going to get a huge concert. <laughs> I said a number, so that yeah. makes sense. Okay. Um, We've had a range of exciting lectures on the topic over the years, um, and tonight's promises to be no exception. Our guest is Carl Elefante. Carl is a principal and director of sustainability at Quinn Evans Architects in Washington, D.C. Quinn Evans is a leading practice in the arena of preservation and sustainable stewardship. The office began as a two-person studio in 1984 and has since grown to have offices in D.C., Baltimore, Ann Arbor, Richmond, and Madison. Simply put, their work fo focuses on architecture that's informed by history and place. Um, Carl's perspective, in particular, emphasizes sustainability as the key lens through which to view architecture today, and highlights the importance of designing spaces which recognize good things, like that people thrive in nature, that they need daylight, movement, fresh air, clean water, but also that they're social beings seeking engagement and fulfillment. In coupling that deep interest in sustainability with the preservation work of Quinn Evans, it's perhaps no surprise that it was Carl who coined the phrase, often cited phrase, the greenest building is one that's already built. If I recall correctly, Jean Caroon may have spoken those very words at this podium a couple of semesters ago. Yeah. Carl knows Jean. In a Trump lecture. In a Trump lecture. lecture. Um, in addition to his role uh, making buildings in his office, Carl is also actively and passionately engaged as an advocate for the profession of architecture. He's a fellow of the American Institute of Architects and last year served as the AIA's 94th president. Through his work at the AIA as president and in other AIA roles prior to that, he has emerged as a true optimist, I would say, in the potential of architecture and its architects, describing them as, quote, highly skilled and educated, disciplined, energetic, hopeful, inspiring, empathetic, and caring. There's a humanist. Coupled with that optimism, he's also clearly pointed to the continuing need and responsibility for architects to imagine and shape cities where over half of the world's current population lives. Carl sees our present moment, the dawn of the urban era, as he calls it, as a tremendous opportunity to work together to create cities where humans can thrive, a moment which we must dare to be great in. Um, so with that, please join me and welcoming Carl Elefante. Thank you, mate. You're welcome. Well, thank you for that uh, amazingly thoughtful uh, introduction, mate. I really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, very much thanks to uh, Stephen for the invitation to be here. Um, really delighted and, and thank you very much for Tremco for making this all possible. Um, so uh, I, I now I have to live up to that introduction and I, I hope to uh, because I really am here uh, as a practicing architect but also somebody that's gotten involved in the leadership of the field and kind of the importance of the world that I've had the opportunity to get to see. And I do think that we're at this enormously important transitional moment in not just the field of architecture, but really in the urban world, where the future of the world has been uh, officially announced that it's going to be an urban future. And I'll get into the details of that a little bit more, but what does that mean for us as the shapers of the built environment? that we're not just shaping the built environment, we're shaping the, the, the conditions in which humanity will exist from here on in. So our, our charge is enormous, that we have to shape the world that we want people to be living in. The, what kind of world do we want them to be in? And 
who is it that is charged by our society and our culture and our economy to imagine that future? It's architects. It's us. Uh, it's our job. And I, you know, I was talking with Nate before. I know that I didn't go to architecture school because I wanted to shape human destiny. I just wanted to design some cool buildings. But part of the accumulated effect of shaping cool buildings is actually shaping the destiny of mankind. And we just have to be aware of that. It, it just, you know, up until literally just this decade, we were kind of, you know, at the edge because the recognition of how important shaping the built environment was to the future of humanity just simply hadn't been recognized. It wasn't understood. But now that's been understood. It's been officially announced by the world uh, that this is the future. We're going to shape the built environment. That's where we're going to live as a species. And uh, that's our job now as architects. So, you know, kind of roll up your sleeves. We got a lot of work to do. And it's really important work. So, um, okay, I've said everything I needed to say. Now I'm just going to get into the details. Uh, so, as Nate <coughs> mentioned, to me, I, I like to think of this as the dawning of the urban era. And just to give you an idea of the, of the pressure, how much energy is behind this, there will be another China's worth of population in the next 11 years added to the world population. By 2050 to 2060, we're, we're going to get to the 10 billion people threshold in that period of time. Uh, when I was a child, we were pushing three. Okay, so we're going from 3 billion people to 10 billion people in, well, maybe a little more than my lifetime. Depends. If I hit 100, we'll, we'll, we'll be there. Um, and look at the modern city. Let, let, let's, let's look back for a minute and just say what happened in the 20th century. Well, in the 20th century, the modern city, the modern world was created. Uh, there's a wonderful anecdote that comes out of... Uh, uh, a uh, former New York Times uh, uh, columnist, a guy named Russell Baker, who was kind of one of the wise men of the, of the 20th century. And from his perspective, he talked about his childhood and looking back at his grandmother's life and seeing that the world that his grandmother grew up in was kind of the world that had existed for 10,000 years. She never saw a doctor. She never went to a hospital. She never saw a lawyer. She never got in a car. You know, that that world that she grew up in was sort of the stasis of human existence for 10,000 years. And that in his lifetime, he literally went from horse and buggy to getting in airplanes and going to conferences across the world. And that world, that modern world, got created since, essentially, 1945, the end of the Second World War. And to just give you an idea of like, well, how much creation really was that? Well, in the United States, the, po the, the, the urban environment, the building stock of this country, and by the way, the population of this country, doubled between 1945 and 1970. And then from 1970 to now, it's doubled again. And between now and 2060, it's projected it will double again. So literally, again, potentially if I get to be a really, really old guy in my lifetime, this country will be eight times bigger than it was when I was born. So that's how much pressure that we're talking about here. But look at, look at what's been accomplished. What do you think any of these cities looked like in 1945? Almost none of those tall buildings were there. So this is what happened. In the 20th century, we created the modern world. Well, we're stuck with it now. We've got to work with it. You know, it's, are you going to throw that out? No, we've got to work with that. Everywhere, it's all over the world. Every country has a city that looks like this. The modern world got created in the last generation. Now we have to work with it. Um, the other thing I just want to say about cities and our sort of orientation is particularly in this country, and frankly, we're 
the, we're kind of the outliers of this. We have this conversation more than anybody else in the world. We talk about the difference between rural America and urban America, and then somewhere in between is suburban America. Let's stop counting the angels on the head of a pin. We all live in, the, in an urban transect. We're all part of an urban environment. Even if you're way out in the country, you know, where do you go have your babies? You get in a car and you go to a hospital, you know, and you're, you're part of that urban transect. Where do you get your gasoline from to drive your pickup truck that has a gun rack in the back? You get it from a company that's producing oil down in Texas and shipping it on interstate highways for you to be able to pump it into your truck. We're all part of the same urban system. Let's stop arguing about stuff that doesn't matter. Whether you live in a place where there's trees uh, that are in your yard or whether there's trees in a sidewalk tree box out in front of your apartment building. We're all part of the same system. And guess what? It's the system that created human culture. It created human progress. Cities created the condition where people were able to specialize according to the skills that they cared about and were able to create human progress. So let's embrace cities. They're our future. Let's stop arguing about false paradigms within that urban transect. We're all part of this. Cities are our future. So I said that this urban era has been officially declared. Well, how has it been officially declared? Well, kind of at the highest level it can be, and that is 195 nations got together in Quito, Ecuador in 2016 and signed the, the Habitat 3 New Urban Agenda. And I welcome you to read the New Urban Agenda. In about 10 pages, your eyes will be completely glazed over. But it, it is uh, a formula for uh, basically realizing Pope Paul VI's uh, 1964 encyclical, in which he said, if you want peace, work for justice. So the New Urban Agenda says we're all going to be together on, on uh, Tom Friedman's hot, flat, and crowded planet. That's our future, hot, flat, and crowded. Uh, how do we get along? How is that going to work? Well, equity and justice need to be there. Otherwise, we have conflict and, and, and just we're, we're too close. We can't have this crowded a world and without dealing with those basic justice and equity issues. So that's what the new urban agenda is about. So number one, we're gonna live in cities, and number two, they're gonna be awesome. And why are they gonna be fantastic? Because you, the architects of the next generation, are gonna imagine these cool, fantastic buildings. That's, you know, when I was in architecture school, my very first week, we had Philip Johnson. Anybody who knows the name of Philip Johnson, it's like, from historic preservation, where you know, so his, his Philip Johnson, who was the most prominent architect in New York when I was there in school in New York, came to my school and said, to the effect of, "Well, you know, how many of you are here because you just want to create awesome, fantastic architecture of the future?" And like two kids in the back of the room had enough nerve to sort of raise their hand, and he said, "Well, what the hell are the rest of you doing here?" You know. <laughs> So if you're not ready to shape human destiny by creating amazing cities, what the hell are you doing here? That's, what, that's our job. Let's get busy. We got a lot of work to do. And in fact, the world community appointed us, officially designated us, that this is our job. Um, the thing that I'd really like you to look at are the UN Sustainable Development Goals. These are a little more tangible. The new urban agenda that's talking about, you know, the kind of more human social principles might be a little hard to access. But if you look at the sustainable development goals, you'll see things that you as an architect can say, oh, they need me to do that. I know how to do that, you know. And, you know, I'll, I'll try to reference that, you know, again uh, as we go through some things here going forward. But I want to kind of end this chapter by saying, this is another aspect of really what, de what defines this time that we're in. So Arnold J. Toynbee, who is sometimes uh, considered to be the number one historian of the 20th century, 
uh, made this statement, and let's just take a minute on this statement. So the 20th century will be chiefly remembered by future generations, not as an era of political conflicts. Were there any memorable political conflicts in the 20th century? Anybody remember the First World War and the Second World War? There were some pretty memorable conflicts, okay? In fact, kind of history-making conflicts, right? And we're not going to re remember it by technical inventions. The 20th century, literally buggy whips to landing on the moon in 63 years of aviation. 63 years of aviation. Went from two guys at Kitty Hawk trying to make a kite have a motor on it to landing on the moon. And what does Toynbee say? That's not the important stuff. The important thing is that for the first time in human society, we actually thought about the well-being of everyone, of something that we could and actually might be able to achieve. That's incredible. And now here we are as the 21st century really gets its legs under it. You know, 2019, if we're not, if we're not comfortable yet with the 21st century, it's about time. And what is, what is the world telling us now? It's an urban future. Uh, we're going to, we oh, literally, it's, it's hot, flat, and crowded. We have to live together. We have to find a way to realize where Toynbee was going with this a century ago. So how in the heck do we do that? We're just a bunch of architects. We just want to design cool buildings and make sure that the steel and the glass and the concrete come together just right, okay? Well, what it really is the design impact opportunity that we have? And I'll basically spend the rest of my time talking about this because I'm an architect and I want to practice architecture to be able to do any of this stuff. That's what we have to do is practice architecture. So the first thing to recognize is that what we do as architects affects the health and well-being of, oh, everyone, everywhere. Okay, that's all. We just impact everyone everywhere. Not a big charge or anything, okay? Well, how, how deep does this go? Uh, you know, is this like a nice to have or is this really in, deeply in the DNA of what we do? The answer is that it's absolutely, unavoidably, deeply in the DNA of what we do as architects. And this is the most important thing that I've ever read that anybody ever said about architecture. First, we shape our buildings, thereafter they shape us. And you, you can't avoid this. Whatever decisions you make to shape the built environment, that is going to create the conditions for the future. This is the responsibility, this is our accountability as architects. And there's no way around it. We can't opt out. Um, and so how deep does this go? How important is this? And I just want to give you one anecdote to give you a sense about the kind of life and death aspect of this. So New York City, 1870, it's after people shooting each other over the Civil War is kind of now out of the demographic. You know, it's just regular old city life. And at this point in time, New York is the biggest engine of commerce and industry in the world. People are looking at New York and going, wow, look at what's going on in New York. Well, one of the things that was going on in New York is nearly two out of three deaths were caused by preventable infectious disease. New York was fatal to live in. Uh, not what people wanted to have to go with that incredible engine of commerce. Um, so by 1940, and I picked 1940 because 1940 is when penicillin becomes available to the general public. So in other words, it's 70 years, and in that period of time, now we have a medical solution to infectious disease, penicillin. Get a shot of penicillin, your infectious disease is gone. Okay, But that number went from 64% to 11%. How did it do that? By changes in the built environment. Okay, so the built environment solved the public health issues of the day. Cholera, dysentery, and, and tuberculosis were the top three killers. Okay, how did they do that? They, they, they put water systems in and sewer systems in, and they adopted building codes that re required light and air. You know, it just, they made a healthier environment for people to live. Um, 
We are uh, faced with a very similar paradigm today where uh, the, the main public health issues that we're faced with today have these enormous environmental factors behind them. So heart disease, diabetes, obesity. Inactivity is number one cause of almost uh, of every one of those, okay? What, what do we do in the built environment to either accommodate or actually even encourage physical activity and people being able to make good choices? And I would even go so far with this to say that the most important influence that has come to the architectural profession from the outside world in the last 20 years is the Centers for Disease Control. You know, would any, anybody see that one coming? You know, it, 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 so the Centers for Disease Control have said, we have these public health issues that we're trying to deal with. They don't just have medical solutions. Environmental solutions are integral to us being able to solve the, this, our public health problems of today, of the 21st century. Architects design fit and healthy cities, design cities and design buildings that allow people to make healthy choices. Um, and it goes really deep too. So it's broad, it's everybody's public health, but it's also your mind, your personality, literally your self. Um, and uh, I recommend uh, Sarah William Goldhagen's book uh, and just the, the proposition that the way your mind works makes it so that what happens in your environment shapes your brain it just does. So there's that whole nurture nature thing that people talk about. And uh, what, what Sarah's work does is really helps you understand that how, how deep in, in your cognitive world this really goes. So just very anecdotally, the hippocampus, we've heard a lot about the hippocampus in the last year. The hippocampus is, it does two things. The first thing it does is it literally records your environment. So you've got your uh, autonomous vehicle scanners try scanning the world around you to make sure that the saber-toothed tiger doesn't jump on you and eat you. Well that part of your brain that's doing that all the time, making sure that you're safe, is your hippocampus. What is the other thing the hippocampus does? It records and it retrieves memories. So the thing that observes your environment is the thing that shapes your memories. What shapes you and your personality and your outlook on the world? Your memories. So you're all, th this is hardwired into your brain that the way that you interact with your environment is literally shaping you as a person. So it's really deep too. Um, so second thing I'm going to talk about is the other, you know, that was real personal about how deep, deeply human the impact of the built environment is. And now let's talk about it in terms of its global impact of literally the earth. Are you all familiar with the term Anthropocene? Is that a, that a term that you guys heard around here? Um, yeah, I'm glad to see a couple of nods. So Anthropocene, you know, geologic time, place to scene, all those scenes, okay? Well, geologists say that we are today in the Anthropocene geological era. Now they use geological time, big time, millions of years even billions of years, okay? Well, what does it mean to be in the Anthropocene, the human era? Is that what's shaping the geology of the world is people. And look at a satellite photo at night. What do you see? The world is covered with people. There's light everywhere. Um, and, you know, we're, we're having more impact on species extinction, we're in the sixth ex great extinction as it's called, you know, uh, and what's causing this one? People. Uh, we're in the middle of global climate change, and I'm going to talk about that in a little more detail in a minute. Uh, what's causing that? People. Uh, so literally people are shaping the world, we're pulling minerals out of the ground, we're moving earth around, we're creating earth where, there, where there's water, etc. We're changing the chemistry of the atmosphere. We're changing the chemistry of the water. What, what's causing that? People are causing that. So we're in this period of us having the biggest impact on the world. 
And the biggest impact that we're having, the one that we just have to talk about, we got to get our arms around, is climate disruption. It is life and death. So again, well, what does that have to do with us as architects? Uh, the world community has got together in Paris in December 2015 and the Paris Accord on climate change said, okay, built environment, you're 40% of the problem, you have to be 40% of the solution. You have to decarbonize the built environment. And the Paris Accord set the rules, set the targets, we know exactly what our job is, zero carbon by 2050, let's get on it, and it's probably too late Let's get to zero carbon by 2030. You know, I mean, the people that are seriously working on this, how do we make it 2020? We are out of time. We have to do this. There's nothing more urgent for us to do now than respond to climate change. And I just want to say one more thing about both the urgency of this and then also about the discourse on climate change today. So. I'm not going to talk about the weather, I'm not going to talk about storms, I'm not going to talk about climate, I'm going to talk about things that we can't argue about because all of those things are so complicated. Ask your weatherman what the weather's going to be like tomorrow. Okay? Th this is complicated stuff. But let's talk about physics and chemistry. Okay? They're not that complicated. You pretty much got this, you know, 2 plus 2 equals 4 in physics and, ke and chemistry. Okay, it's pretty, pretty direct. There's not a lot of argument about it. So we have changed the atmosphere, the chemistry of the atmosphere, more than it has changed in at least 15 million years. Okay, that's how big of an impact that we've had on it. We've gone from 185 parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere to, to now we're over 400 parts per million. Oh, that's okay, 185, 400, what's the difference? Okay, well, this is the difference. So if we're good, if we get this right, and we take care of this now, if we're lucky, we'll stop at 500 parts per million. Okay, and then we got this whole question of can we take carbon out of the air? And why is that a question? Because the last time the world had 500 parts per million of climate, of, of carbon in the atmosphere, this was what was going on in the world. It was at least 10 degrees warmer than it is now, everywhere. Okay, so, you know, uh, summers around here might get up into the 90s. How about summers around here getting up into the hundreds all the time? Okay, that's, that's what we're talking about. Oh, it snows here a couple times in the winter? How about it never snows again? Okay, but the other part is even more amazing. There's hardly any ice. The only ice is on the South Pole. What happened to the rest of that ice? It becomes ocean, and the ocean was 130 feet higher. Do you realize that Providence doesn't exist? Not like, oh, we're going to build a wall and we're going to put some riprap up. Providence doesn't exist. The coast, Boston doesn't exist. The coast is somewhere near Springfield. Okay, Washington, D.C. becomes a coastal city. That's what we're talking about. And it's not if it will happen. When the atmosphere has 500 parts per million in it, that is what happens. That's physics. So the question is, when does it happen? Does it happen when you're practicing architecture? You know, the worst models say it's going to happen in 50 years, and that we have this catastrophic calamity that's right around the corner. Every one of the ice shelves is showing catastrophic changes to it, that the scientists are going, my god, what's happening? We don't know. We can't predict. Every one of the ice shelves, okay? If you just take Greenland away, you've got 40 feet more of water. That's just Greenland, okay? 40 feet more water, you think that might be a problem? Every coastal city in the world is, is, is either gone or in serious condition. So maybe it's 5,000 years. Maybe your great, 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 great grandchildren don't even have to worry about this. But we don't know when it will get to that. What we do know is that 500 parts per million, it will get to that. So let's stop talking about whether climate change is real. This is something that we have the power to solve today, and it's our job. It's not for the next generation, and it's not for somebody else besides architects. It's for architects, too. This is our number one job that we have to do. And 
I want you all to know, my generation apologizes to your generation. We gave this to you. We thought we were making the world a better place. We were creating that modern world that you guys were going to like get to go to parties on rooftops and stuff. Not to go to rooftops to get out of the ocean. Okay, but you, this is it. This is your, this is your challenge, guys. This is this is what your career will be about. It is absolute compulsory worldwide cooperation. I'm sort of waiting for the world to wake up and say, "Okay, U.S., we're not going to let you get away with this BS anymore. You got to do something about your carbon. You can't deny it." Um, so, okay, architects, what can we do? What a horrible, depressing thing to be thinking about. On the other hand, it sure does make us relevant. Uh, but what can we do? What, you know, what's, what's our role? Is there hope in this? And I just want to say, if I communicate nothing else here tonight, I want to communicate that this isn't just hopeful. This is awesome that th this is what we get to do. This is our charge. I mean, uh, it, I just said something about everyone, everywhere. Well, this says everything because we have to change everything that we're doing. So our proposition is to reinvent a world that all people are going to live in. We're going to figure out a way for them to be in, a, in an equitable and just world together. And it's going to be done by tweaking everything and getting the carbon out of it. So we have to reinvent absolutely everything we do. So our charge is over the next generation, everyone, everywhere, everything. Wow, what a challenge. What an opportunity. No one has ever been faced with this opportunity before your generation. You know, the whole thing of the greatest generation of World War II, that was child's play compared to this. You guys have truly the greatest generation challenge in front of you. So let's get busy. Um, so Paris, what was, the, what was the biggest story in Paris? The biggest story in Paris was the American architectural profession. And what did the American architectural profession do? They did this, this chart. So the red thing that's going up there at 45 degrees, Back in 2006, when we started to make the original predictions on this, that's what was going to be happening, the energy and the building sector in the United States of America over the next decade leading up to Paris. Okay, you see the green line kind of in the middle? The EIA you know, AEO 2014? That's the actual energy consumption that happened in that decade period. Now, wouldn't we all love to get down to that lower one? But that's what—that's our challenge. But so the American architectural profession, by creating energy-conscious buildings, added 20 billion square feet to the American building stock and kept the energy consumption level flat nationwide. That's like a miracle, right? Because we're magicians. But no, we're not magicians. We're just architects paying attention to energy after generations of not paying any attention to it. You know, the AIA headquarters opened in 1973, just before the Arab oil embargo. It was the first time that people started to think about energy. The building was built without light switches because you, they didn't want you to turn off the lights because that, may, that, that shortens the life of the bulbs. So it was just a building that was going to burn its lights all the time because what's energy? Who cares? Well, if we actually pay attention to it, we can actually do it. And the American architectural world stunned them in Paris by this amazing story of 20 billion square feet of new buildings, no, no more energy. So what specifically do we have to do? Four things, and I, I know that every one of you can not just count to four, but you can remember four things that you need to do. And one is increase renewable energy. We have to get to 100% renewables. Two zero net carbon buildings. Let's just design the carbon out of the buildings. We don't have to burn fossil fuels to operate buildings. We, For thousands of years, buildings were operated without f fossil fuels. Transform the existing buildings, and I'm going to come back and talk about that a lot. That's our big challenge now, is to transform that modern world 
that we're faced with, and then reduce embodied carbon, which we're going to work with our friends from Tremco, and we're going to get all the carbon, embodied carbon, out of the building materials that we use. So that's it. Those are the four things we need to do. And we know how to do each and every one of them. So here it is. Here's our challenge. What do we do with these cities? And I'll just say one more thing about them. You see, each one of these, and I, I, actually I hope you recognize some of these cities. I mean, they're pretty common cities. So anybody care to guess which city, what, what, we got, what we got up here? Pardon? Yeah, so Chicago top right, New York below it, uh, LA bottom right, and then downtown Houston top left. And so a kind of amazing thing about that is you got these clusters of tall buildings. Well, pretty much true with all of them that that tall building cluster is about 50% of their carbon footprint. The rest of the city is the other 50%. So we actually have these two challenges of the concentrated greenhouse gas emission challenge and the distributed greenhouse gas emission challenge. Uh, and those, those two worlds exist in almost every one of these modern cities. We need two different solutions to address them. So how are we going to address them? We're going to address them by looking at the existing building stock. And, and really doing what we need to do with the existing building stock. And everything else I'm going to talk about tonight is about that. How do we meet the existing building stock challenge? And, um, you know, uh, Nate quoted me from the Greenest Building Statement, and the folks at the National Trust about 10 years ago or so decided to challenge me and like, well, what do you really know about that? What, what does that mean anyhow? So they're like, we're going to do a study and we're going to prove you wrong. And so they did this greenest building study. And guess what? They proved me right. You know, and, you know, so th this whole notion of we talk about operating energy and then we talk about embodied energy. We talk about operating carbon. We talk about embodied carbon. Well, our challenge is that embodied carbon is actually a huge part of this uh, challenge that we face. And uh, so the, the addressing the existing buildings, uh, it, you know, it involves embracing that. Uh, I'll talk about avoided carbon as part of this. Um, but right now, our carbon footprint is produced by what? It's produced by the buildings that are here. So if we're going to get to zero, we have to make the current footprint go to zero, not just the new buildings that we're designing. So that's our challenge. So first, how do we wrestle this into place? We need to come up with a plan. We need to have a way that we're going to do this and, and just give us a measurable, uh, methodical thing that we can do together. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to wrestle this question of what cultural value really represents. And I'm saying this as a person who is a preservation professional uh, that embraces, you know, the stewardship of historic preservation, but also recognizes how uh, it can create its own set of challenges. So um, we do need to think about buildings as contributing to human culture and helping to define us as a society, you know. Uh, I live in Washington, D.C. We have these icons of the Capitol building and the Lincoln Memorial and the White House that, you know, Americans go to those sites every day and they literally break into tears because it means something to us as Americans. Those things, that physical environment, it symbolizes things that are absolutely fundamental to us. So it isn't like, oh, this cultural stuff doesn't matter. It does matter. And, but we have to sort it out. We don't have it sorted out very well right now. And th th the next thing I'll just say about it is that our historic preservation sensibilities were developed basically by the colonial dames who preserved Mount Vernon. That, that That's where it comes from. The first president, the founding father of the country, we're going we're gonna to preserve his house forever. Okay, that was, that was their charge to themselves and the world and the architects that, that are engaged with this building. So the cultural value here is, couldn't be more extreme, you know. 
And the notion that there, this absolute sort of uh, icon of history needs to be preserved. But we're now trying to apply that sensibility to all these other buildings in city after city after city after city all around the world. And it just isn't working in a lot of places. It's not working in as many places as it is working. We've got to figure out how to deal with the notion of cultural value and, the, and, the, and, and what, we, what we really want to keep of these existing buildings. And I'm going to come back and talk about that a little bit more. The second is just really understanding the statistics of what we're faced with. So those historic buildings that bring a tear to our eye because they're the traditions of America and so on, it's 11% of our building stock at most. And uh, just to give you an idea, I've been, I've been paying attention to this for 30 years. That number has dropped from 15% to, to 11% in those 30 years just because we built so much more stuff. So that sort of traditional historic preservation, George Washington slept here, just because we keep building and building and building, that keeps shrinking and shrinking and shrinking in terms of its percentage of what we're dealing with. So it's becoming this tangential issue. So we can't let our thinking about something that is actually a little tiny piece of our world tell us what to do about the entire building stock. We've got to be more nuanced than that. And then here's the other one that's a, a number that, I, that really you know, kind of keeps me awake at night is so that the modern era buildings, the things that were built after the Second World War, uh, they're, and before, by the way, we had any energy conscious design and we're really trying to do green buildings and high performance buildings, that's two thirds of the existing building stock. So that modern era building stock of big glass buildings or lots of suburban houses and so on, that's two thirds of what we're facing. That's our challenge. What do we do with this two thirds of the building stock? Uh, and it is very different from what we had with that first group. Um, so now let's face the challenge and, and, and how do we actually have a plan where we can deal with the existing building stock and address the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and address the new urban agenda and shape this awesome, fantastic future that you guys are going to imagine as architects. So how do we do it? Well, the first thing we have to do is stop being wasteful. And the, and the number one way we have to stop being wasteful is to use all the buildings we have. Um, anybody have any idea about the number of abandoned buildings in the city of Detroit? Anybody want to hazard a guess? You are eight times too low. There are 40,000 empty buildings in Detroit. Now, Detroit's the record holder in this country. Number two, anybody want to guess number two empty building city, you know, award? Baltimore, Maryland. Okay, so Baltimore, about 16,000 abandoned buildings, okay? Which is why the wire was in Baltimore, by the way. Um, so a, a, another kind of tip, more typical city might have more in the neighborhood of about 5,000 empty buildings. So like a good city, only has 5,000 empty buildings in it. So th that's ridiculous that we're not using all this infrastructure investment, all this material investment, all these neighborhoods that were built, and we're just literally they're just sitting there, the pigeons are living there. Um, there is a whole world out there of particularly fire marshals going to conferences and talking about what do we do about these ban abandoned buildings. And you know what their solution is? Tear them down. Tear them down. Go to your city council, go to your county council, go to your mayor, get them to adopt the program to tear down buildings. Literally, there are hundreds of people that go to conferences every year to talk about how can we, how can we get the mayor to tear down our buildings. Um, and our challenge is that uh, the scale of the solution and the scale of the problem don't match. Okay, so I'll give you Washington DC. The typical building before 1945 in Washington DC was 25 feet wide. Okay, that's a little tiny building. Put two 
code compliant emergency stairs and an elevator to make that building handicapped accessible in a 20 foot, 25 foot wide building. You can't do it. You can't afford to do that. The only people that can afford to do that are the rich associations that are buying townhouses in Georgetown. It's hard, okay? So these are examples of a couple of different projects that actually these are Quinn Evans' work of trying to take multiple buildings and link them together. And, and the, on the top right there is an image from Saline, Michigan, where we've got this like catwalk system that joins, I think it's four buildings together. So there's one elevator, there's two sets of stairs that link four buildings together so that you're only buying a fourth of an elevator instead of four elevators for the four buildings. So we've got to scale up these solutions so that they work with the building stock that's there. Um, actually, one of the most interesting places to see examples of how to cluster buildings together is actually a new building design uh, place, which is Celebration, Florida. Look at the housing design in Celebration, and you will see about six different models of how to approach housing design and, and to make some of these efficiencies of scale work. And that's, that's all new design. And that's because Robert A.M. Stern, who made the pattern book, is a historian, and he studied this stuff, and, and he, he wanted his pattern book to reflect this. Um, growth strategy. So we have to keep the buildings that we have. Let's occupy the buildings we have. We also have to grow the buildings we have. It, densification is a reality. It's happening in every city around the, around the country. And that's a reasonable thing to expect of our buildings. Um, well, here are some examples of current growth strategies. And I know in, in historic preservation crowds, when I show this slide, there's gasping. At, you know, audible gasping in the audience. <gasps> oh my God! Look at that building. It's so much taller than the than the neighboring townhouses. And you know, what does that got to do? A glass thing got to do with the stone base and so on. Um, I think that there are some people that would defend some of these. I actually would defend several of them. But you know, it, it just let's have this di dialogue. Let's have this discourse. We've got to densify buildings. We have to densify existing neighborhoods, existing neighborhoods that we want to continue to contribute to our culture and society, but we can't just freeze them in time. It, when we freeze them in time, only rich people can afford to live there. Only rich people can put those two fire stairs and that one elevator in that 25-foot wide building. So if we're going to make it affordable and equitable, we've got to deal with some of these problems and our discourse is not getting there today. Um, so I'll conclude this by, you know, so how big is this challenge? You know, like, like okay, you're architecture students, how much attention should you be paying attention to this? Well, this is the, this is the most important slide for you to pay attention to tonight. You can see that gray stuff, those are projected new buildings that are going to be added during your career, okay? The orange stuff are the buildings that need to be renovated during your career. Is there kind of a lot of both? You know, I mean, th there's a whole bunch of orange up there. I, I would go so far as to say you ought to be thinking that you're going to, half of you are going to spend your careers doing nothing but renovation work. Are half of you learning on that track? Are half of you thinking about you being building adapters? and expanders, because half of you, that's how you're going to make your living, is doing those orange buildings. That, you know, you, that, that's it, man. It's coming, coming your way. Uh, get, get ready. Be prepared. This is your future. And by the way, who's going to make those amazing transformations that are going to save us by getting rid of the incredibly awful greenhouse gas footprint we have now? You guys that devote yourself to the orange buildings, you, you're the saviors. You get extra credit. Um, so, uh, I, I, you know, I talked about the 20th century and this incredible two-thirds of the building stock is in modern era buildings. We've got to deal with them. And again, how, how close are we? How, how good are we at doing this? Um, I like to show this slide because 
remember that bad preservation exists and it's practiced a lot and again in a, in a preservation audience when I show this slide every single person in the room will say yep th bo those are both examples of bad preservation and I just want to get anybody whose head is there uh, I want to challenge you and say I actually think one of them's bad and the other one's good okay and why, why do I say that that 19th century building that's being preserved by just preserving the facade it's a really stupid way to preserve a building. I mean, my goodness, you know, it's this incredible effort to paint a face on a building, okay? There are places that it's done. I'm not gonna tell you to stop, never do it again, but it's a huge amount of effort for sort of like very little result, okay? On the other hand, you've got the 20th century building where what you've done is you have uh, completely stripped the skin off the building You've taken all the mes mechanical systems out. You've basically taken everything that's tired and worn out, and you've replaced it with stuff that's new. Now, there's only one thing wrong with this example, and this is a building right around the corner from my office. This is not one that I made up. This is uh, uh, photographs that were taken over the course of about a year. Um, the bad thing about this is that they threw away a lot of stuff that had plenty of life left to it. So you see that precast concrete panels that are on this building? Those things could last a thousand years. And they threw them in the landfill because they didn't look cool. Because they wanted to create that building that, you know, is the current version of what looking cool is, and that is a glass box. I just want a little editorial comment. There's no such thing as a sustainable glass box building. It's a lie. It is a bad wall system that somebody decided look cool and okay, we're gonna put a cool mechanical system in and we're gonna call it sustainable. That really awesome, really great glass curtain wall system has a, a thermal rating about the equivalent of a single white of brick with no insulation line. That is not a good wall system. That is not, and that, none of that, you're getting more daylight than you can use. It's just a, not a good, good building design. So the idea though, that you have to replace whatever's worn out and put in new stuff to renew a building every 50 years or so, that's, that's true. You gotta do that stuff. You gotta reinvest in buildings. And the modern era building stock presents a, a real challenge because many of them are lousy curtain wall systems that were designed with inoperable windows and are addicted to fossil fuels and lousy mechanical systems that are ridiculously inefficient. And yeah, let's replace that stuff with things that are actually good and really work. There's actually some really interesting work that's being done. And these are just three uh, pretty well-known towers that are just three examples of, well, how do you try to do something better? And you know, so the, the Green Wyatt, which is in uh, Portland, they literally put this, you're seeing the west facade there, this uh, almost like with your sunscreens that are on the side of the building here, they put this, this screen to just simply put vegetation mostly to, to, to protect that side of the building from solar gain, okay? Uh, historic preservationists, did it change the character of the building? You bet it did, okay? Um, is that okay? It's okay in my book. Um, the, the Celebrezzi building, which is in uh, Cleveland, um, they literally took that building with the concrete panels in the previous, the, the Celebrezzi building looked like this, and they clad it in glass and they did a double curtain wall. So literally the precast panels and the old, the, the old glazing is under this. So they just created a double facade by literally adding the outer facade. Uh, did it change the character of the building? You bet it did. But of all these examples, it's the one that kept the most. It's the one that respected the embodied carbon and the embodied material of that existing building more because it didn't take it out. It added to it, okay? And then the third example is Lever House, which was renovated by the same architects that built it. And what did they do? Nothing that you see is original. All of it's new but they put it back to look exactly the way that it looked before. 
So in this whole conversation about cultural value and so on that we've had, what matters here? Is it the building that kept the embodied materials and that previous investment in the middle? <coughs> is it the building that added stuff to, uh, to make it so that the performance would just simply be better because you're really putting stuff there that was missing? Or is it the one that, rep that replaced everything completely but actually kept a cultural icon? And I would argue all three of these are important examples. All three of these were done and should have been done. It's not one size fits all. So the modern year building stock is uh, just a big challenge. You know, this is actually images from about maybe eight or nine years ago with uh, the Boston City Hall when Mayor Mineo came in and said, oh, this is the worst building in the world, we've got to tear it down. When I was in architecture school, I'm going to give you an idea of what an official old guy I was. This was the brand new building in town that everybody like went to Boston to go pray in front of this building. This was it. The Boston City Hall. Oh my God, brutalist concrete. Yes, we pray to you, you know. Wow, that building's upside down. I mean, it, literally, this was the most important building from about 1970. Uh, it, does it meet the historic preservation criteria? You bet it does. It's an important landmark building. Uh, but, well, can you do these things to it to make it usable for another generation? I would say, let's talk about it. Let's, let's make it happen. Let's make that building be usable for another generation. And, you know, in, in 50 years, if you think that stuff's ugly, take it off. You know, do something else. Buildings do that. Um, so this challenge is big, uh, you know, this is um, Terrapin Great Bright, Bright Green, who is, uh, uh, you know, one of the founders of Rocky Mountain Institute, uh, Bill Browning, you know, they did a study of the New York skyscrapers and are basically like, oh my God, what the hell are we going to do with all these skyscrapers in New York? It's a big challenge. Uh, whoever figures this one out, you've got a really great career ahead of you, you're going to be busy going to make a fortune. Just remember that modern building stock. The, 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 these cities, we created city after city after city after city. You, you will never run out of work doing this. Ever, ever. You will be whatever kind of car you want to drive. Actually, you won't be driving cars anymore. They'll be driving you. But, you know, whatever you want, you know, uh, it's going to be yours. Just solve this problem. You got a whole career of incredible prosperity ahead of you if you do it. So we have to get into this new mode, and the, and the way we we need to start is by accelerating what's going on. It's just we're scratching the surface of this, and so part of you as advocates and as and and as spokespeople for. Uh, doing this, what you're going to be doing in your career, you know, in a lot of ways, the most important thing that you're going to be doing in your career is being convincing, and to have and have clear messages that you can articulate to people that don't understand that you, what you understand. Most of the people you deal with will not understand what you're talking about. You have to be able to draw pictures, and in what it, with whatever you know intelligence you're using. You, you have to convince people because they can't picture it. You're the futurists. You're, you're coming and getting this training so that you can see the future. Most of the people that you deal with can't and will never be able to. So you've got to be able to make this argument. You've got to be able to be the, that convincing person in this. And, you know, this goes all the way back to Jane Jacobs. You know, I would say in a lot of ways, really understanding what the modern world needs to be like really does go back to Jane Jacobs articulating it. And she recognized the, the importance of, of old buildings, that there are things that you can do, there are economies that work in existing buildings that don't work when you have to build a new building. You know, where are the startups? Brooklyn Navy Yard, where an old building got converted, you know, because you can afford it. Yeah, you know, very, very direct stuff. But what, make yourself do some homework on real estate economy and building reuse economy. You just, th this is the world that you're going to exist in. Somebody's going to make a decision 
based on these economic rules. And it's not just whether your design is the coolest thing that they've ever seen. Not that that's not important, it's super important. But it's also, you know, the, these economics. And, you know, so reuse economics is sustainable green economics is the message here. And, you know, read Donovan Ripkema's work, you know. Um, when you expand this out to the global scale, um, th it, 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 this is like, oh my God, can I be part of a hundred trillion dollar undertaking? You know, to, to sound like there might be a few bucks in it for you if there's a hundred trillion dollars of work being done here. And, and let me just say this another way with, so decarbonization, okay? Decarbonization has also been estimated to be a hundred trillion dollar undertaking, okay? That's, that's a stunning amount of money. The air goes out of the room when you say a, a number like a hundred trillion dollars. If, if the numbers are real to you. But that's about 10% of the world economy between now and 2060, okay? So if I, instead of scaring you with the $100 trillion, if I just came to you and said, hey, you're the board of directors of planet Earth, are you willing to redirect 10% of your economy to solve climate change and to decarbonize the built environment? Don't you think you'd, you'd, you'd like sign right on? And you know, if you were a corporate board, you were like, our, our corporate existence is dependent upon us redirecting 10% of our corporate resources. They wouldn't even have to like go into corners and discuss it with each other. They would just approve it right then and there. So this is a doable proposition. And okay, <coughs> if 40% of the greenhouse gas footprint is architecture, and we just like, get simple math here. In your career, you want to be part of a $40 trillion undertaking? Your prosperity is all tied up with this stuff. This is the biggest job offer that anybody's ever been given in the history of the Earth. There's no reason to turn away from this. This is your future. And it's just calling to you. And it's going to make you rich. So I, I'm sorry to be appealing to your lower motives here, but uh, frankly, uh, it's, it's motivated me in my career as well. So look, uh, monetizing carbon. You know, so so what, what's another thing that you really have to understand about this economic formula? You have to understand about how to monetize carbon. The world is trying to figure out how to monetize carbon. Um, it's come to the US. California monetized carbon in 2006. Anybody in this room even know that a carbon economy was officially adopted by a state, the, the eighth largest economy in the world, more than 10 years ago? I mean, what are we talking about? We're talking about what Trump tweeted. Let's talk about the stuff that's important. Let's get informed about this stuff. So the carbon economy exists in California. How much of it is really understood in terms of the, the built environment? And the answer to that is actually it's child's play. They're, they're just beginning to try to understand the built environment. The good news about that is that there's still plenty of time for us to shape it. The bad news is we better get busy because in another five years, the programs will be in place. So now's the time for us to get involved with really shaping what are the things that, you know, AB 32 and all the copycats in state after state. So there are eight other states doing a copycat of this today. Doing it, you know, so the carbon economy is coming. We have to be part of it. So now I just want to uh, end with uh, spending a few minutes and talking about, you know, okay, well, what the heck does an architect do? How, how, how do you as an architect do this? How do you address this in your practice? And I just want to show you some things from my practice and talk about it in those terms. And all of it basically falls under this category of optimizing intervention. We're, you know, the roof's going to leak after 30 years or maybe 50 years, depending on whether you use a Trimco trunk, trunk roof or not. Okay? You know, so, so we're going to have to reinvest in our buildings on a pretty regular basis. Well, what are you doing when you intervene with those buildings? How are you optimizing those buildings? So um, I want to throw a, a shout out to Gene Caroon, who I know has been here. So 
do we know how to intervene with existing buildings and basically do it in a sustainable way? Do we? There's even a book written by a you know New England architect who's an awesome book, a fantastic book. Get that book. It's your new Bible. Start to intervene with buildings using that Bible because we've got it. You don't have to go reinvent this stuff. So um, I, I'd like to start with a really classic preservation project. Okay, the National Academy of Sciences building, Bertram Goodhue. You walk into a building like this as a preservation architect and you throw yourself at the feet of the client and you say, thank you for hiring me to do this job. Oh my God, what did I ever do to deserve this? What an amazing building. And this building is gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Uh, the inside is the most beautiful art meets architecture of literally any building I've ever worked with. It's just fantastic. And, and actually, Goodhue worked with a whole stable of artists to do uh, bronze work and iron work and woodwork and mosaics. And actually, that uh, what looks like it might be a mosaic in the, in the main hall there, that's actually watercolor that is painted on with a water-based paint, what would a sprinkler system do to this room? It would destroy it. So, okay, I'm an architect. What am I going to do? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is sprinkler the building. Not in that space, you're not. So at any rate, this amazing, awesome opportunity for us to work with. Um, the building grew over time. Buildings do. This building actually got about three times bigger in the 60s uh, where Harrison and Abramowitz, and there's another name from the modernist past, uh, did three additions to this building. And when they did so, they created these courtyards that you can see on the left, which are, let's see, there's a technical term for these spaces. Awful, I think, awful. These, they created these awful courtyards, and if you were bad and you got into a big argument with the head of the National Academy of Sciences, they would assign you to an office looking into one of these courtyards to punish you. Okay, um, So this is our project. What are we going to do? And we very quickly realized that we had this amazing preservation project to do, but our transformation opportunity was to work with those courtyards. So we changed those courtyards and we capped them and turn them into atria and finish them as finished spaces and uh, you know literally created additional rooms and most of these are pre-function rooms for the meeting rooms that surround them so we improved the floor plan 100 percent by doing this and the other thing that you'll notice is the kind of weird skylights that are up there well the south facing skylights are building integrated photovoltaics so that number one, we reduce the amount of daylight to being actually a workable amount of daylight. Most atriums, most all glass buildings have too much daylight. They, they, they create glare conditions, you know. We also clustered spaces like computer lab type spaces around the skylighted areas because the lighting was better for that sort of low, lower light work. Um, so at any rate, the intervention can be transformative. Um, so, adapting buildings, you know, we have to really sometimes make them so they're different. Well, we actually have really great examples of adapted buildings. New York Soho is, you know, my favorite example of this, of buildings that were built for industrial purposes and now they're being used for everything, from artist studios to, to residential lofts, to office lofts, to retail spaces. I mean. What makes these buildings adaptable? And I would argue what makes them adaptable is that they were so generic. They had good high ceilings, most of them 15 feet or more. They had windows within a reasonable uh, distance to the interior of the building. Uh, they had free plans, you know, that, that there were uh, structural columns, whether it were wood or steel or cast iron. Uh, so you could clear the whole plan out and you could adjust it and make it uh, for whatever else you wanted to. Uh, and so these, were, these are highly, highly adapted buildings. Um, well, the modern era buildings, uh, a lot of them actually have similar bones of these structural grids that are steel or concrete framed uh, slabs and, and column grids. 
and have that same free plan and have that ability to be adaptable. The Washington example that I showed you before, it's at, uh, on the top left here, the, the problem in Washington is that all those buildings have eight foot ceilings in them and it's really, really hard to get daylight in, back into them because uh, of the height limit, short sightedness, thinking that, that short stories are a good idea. But um, uh, you might uh, recognize from, from North Dartmouth the Kearney Library by Bob Miklos and Design Lab. Uh, you know, talk about a problem building to work with. How about a Paul Rudolph campus with crazy concrete buildings that, you know, if you want to put a new door in, you got somebody with a jackhammer for two days to try to get through the wall. Very unadaptable building, and yet Design Lab's solution, totally transformative. So even these difficult buildings, there's ways to work with them. There's ways to transform them. So um, uh, don't be afraid to adapt. And, and uh, the last thing I want to say about the adaptability is design for adaptability. And um, I'll just give you uh, an example of, of what do I mean by that. So the building code. The building code requires, you know, just going back to that, you know, eight-story building in Washington. That's got to be a 1A construction. Everybody know what 1A construction is? Very robust, fireproof, okay? And by the way, it's all made out of concrete or steel. That's something that's going to last a thousand years, no problem. It's even going to resist a pretty spanky earthquake, okay? So you're going to design a building that the code says, for fire purposes, must be built to last forever. Where is the one word in the code that gives you one piece of advice that if you're going to build a building that has a structural frame and other elements that last a thousand years, this is how to design a building that can still be valuable for a thousand years, that can be adaptable for a thousand years. And the answer to that question is there's not a word in the code that advises you on that. Who has to bring that agenda to the table? You do. You're the architects. You're the ones that understand what long-term value is and how to make buildings adaptable and valuable over time. You're the one that understands that you are investing this enormous amount of material and energy and carbon resource into creating a building, and you can create a building that's adaptable. Just use some simple common sense ideas uh, and, and build, design buildings that are adaptable. You know, Bill McDonough likes to say, I, every project that I look at, I want to know if I can adapt it to housing. Because every, you know, if you look at the adaptability history, whether it's the uh, 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 Teatro Marcello in, in Rome that is now housing, you know, or whether it's a uh, building like these office buildings, you know, the, the current trend, the big trend in suburban office buildings right now is converting them to senior housing. That's the number one trend in suburban office buildings. Because what the hell are you going to do with all these suburban office buildings? Or half of them are empty. Oh, we need a whole lot of uh, you know senior housing. And guess what? It's all the people that used to work in that building. Now they're all old. And they're right here in the neighborhood. Oh, we'll convert the, we'll convert the office building. So think about designing buildings that are adaptable buildings. So I talked about this long-term value. And, kind of end with this notion. Um, you know, okay, these are the buildings that are official AIA greenest buildings in the world. These are the code top 10 buildings. And actually, I apologize. These are last year's code top 10 buildings. I need to get to work and do a new slide. Um, but, I, but I would argue that uh, we need to be thinking about these buildings as being the greenest buildings in the world. And this is a project in Detroit that we did a few years ago. So 71 Garfield, there's actually a, a, a fascinating story about this, of being uh, part of the black renaissance in Detroit, when Detroit was a, was a big African American city. It was, it was really kind of like right at the top of the list of that sort of you know Harlem renaissance. Uh, not quite to Harlem, but pretty darn close. And you know, so, uh, guys like Duke Ellington are out, you know, making the rounds and so on. So this is part of the neighborhood where that was happening. And it was, it was actually kind of the arts and, and, and music district in Detroit. Well, uh, look what happened. 
abandoned building. This building had trees growing up through it. Okay, is there any valuable any value to this building? Find the value. That's your challenge. Find the value. So the first thing we did was fix it, so that it kept the rain out. You know, and just all that very simple preservation and and maintenance work to make it to be a whole building again. Buildings require reinvestment on a regular cycle. We also did the the, uh, the developer for this is a nonprofit faith-based developer said that she wanted this project to be green plus art equals cool. That was her that was her thing of how she was going to sell this building. Okay, and so uh, we put solar panels over the whole roof, including both. Uh, these are cylindrical solar tubes. That's a whole other topic, uh, and and uh, thermal um, uh, ray, uh, thermal solar as well, and then also a ground source heat pump for the building. If you do that on a building like this, that's a three-story building, you can do a zero net building. It's it's right there. It's cooked in to those systems. <coughs> Just do it. Just cover your buildings with solar panels. Put in ground source heat pumps. Um, <coughs> so. A couple of years ago, this headline-making building, the Edge in Amsterdam, the greenest building in the world, literally, that, that you know, that world's greenest office building, that was the headline. And what does this building do? It uses all this amazing, arti uh, you know, artificial intelligence. Everybody gets a little badge, you know, their like worker badge with their name on it, but it's also got a little chip that tells the building where they are at all times. Well, that's not too creepy, is it? Um, but as a result of that, if you go into a room, it knows that the room is filled with more people that like it cool than people that like it warm. So the building adjusts because there's more more men in the room than women, basically, is how that formula works out. So, so the building is doing all this stuff automatically, and it's keeping track of everything that you do every time you go in a conference room or whatever, okay? So that's the super cool, 21st century future. Okay, everybody who wants that future, please raise your hand. I, I get it, but it creeps me out. Really? Does, does something else have to do all my thinking for me? Do I get to do some of my own thinking and open a window or something? Well, to me, this is the greenest building, circa 1887, which is uh, the pension building in Washington, D.C., which is this enormous uh, example of both thermal mass to just make a stasis. If you go to New Mexico and you look at Adobe construction or whatever, you have, see this whole architectural tradition of stasis. Just create buildings that modify whatever's going on outside. Because what's going on outside is it's getting up to 95 degrees in the day and then it's going down to 30 degrees at night. So you want, you want this building that just moderates it and, and smooths everything out. And this is an example of that with this amazing uh, air system that comes in from every window, goes up through the roof. It just, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a, you know, a passive designed building on a grand scale that just works like a charm. Well, what do we do with buildings like this today? How good are we at, at working with buildings like this today? And I'm gonna show you my last example, which is, a building from a similar period of time in Washington. This is by Adolf Kloos, who was a, a contemporary of Montgomery Meigs. Adolf Kloos built 96 buildings in Washington. There are six left. This is one of them. And this actually was almost destroyed by a catastrophic fire. Well, what did Kloos do? Got this long, narrow building that's a market building. <coughs> he designed this. So if you, the basement, is this big ice storage room where they keep all the meats and vegetables. It's where they refrigerate. And the way that they refrigerated back then was they cut ice from the winter, made by winter, <laughs> and cut it up into blocks, and they put it in this space, and they put some straw on it to kind of insulate it a little bit, and they stored the ice in here. And the ice stayed all summer long, and it kept the meat and the, and the produce fresh, okay? How, much, how many fossil fuels did it take to create the ice? None. 
how much fossil fuels did it take to keep the ice fresh all summer long? None. They just got blocks of ice and they put it in the basement. How good is that? Okay. But look what else they did. They also created these little vent spaces that went down there, and then actually floor vents that they could open and close. Uh, let's see, the artificial intelligence would give them a little signal, a little light would flash when it was time to open the vent, right? No. They would get hot and sweaty, and they would open the vent. And the vent would take air coming across the ice in the basement and up into the room. And how many fossil fuels were consumed in doing that? None. Okay. And then the air, the hot air, would go out the, the, the vent up at the top. Okay. And how many fossil fuels were consumed to create that ventilation system? None. You can be smart. You don't have to be wasteful. You know, architects can do smart things that work and that don't need artificial intelligence to make them operate. We've got to get back to this, because look what we did to this building, and, and we being architects. So in the 70s, they renovated this building, they got rid of the skylight, they got rid of the vent, they put fans in to essentially do the same thing that the vent had always been doing by itself, okay? And then, of course, they got rid of the ice and they put heat producing refrigerators in the basement. So now instead of having something that you can open the vent and cool yourself with, now you've got like a hundred little machines down there cooking your feet, making it worse, making it so you have to have more cooling to keep the space cool. So th this was our idea of a modernizing and improving a building. Okay, and, and this, is, th this is what was done in its own version to that wonderful uh, pension building. Close up all those windows, because the engineer is going to quit if I, don't, if I don't seal the windows, okay? And then put a big mechanical system in there that uses fossil fuel to keep it cool the way that the windows used to do. So we're still doing this every day to building after building after building. Let's get to the next mode, shall we please? Can we please get to the next state on this? Because we're, it, it, this is done. We need to be done with this. We we need to be on to better models. So I'm just going to end by, again, telling you about how important you are and what a magic moment this is, and also how empowered you are. Now you're just architects, okay? You're going to always be dealing with all these other people. There's going to be financiers and there's going to be building code officials, and there's going to be developers, and there's going to be clients that don't like the color you picked, or whatever, you know, you're going to be part of this enormous community to create the buildings that you're creating. Don't get beat up by it. Accept that that's the dynamic world that you're part of as an architect. It's, it's a wonderful challenge that you're, that you're faced with. You are a member of this merry band of people called architects and planners who are shaping the built environment, shaping the city. You are the Margaret Mead group of committed people. You know, the AIA is 94,000 members. That's a lot of people, right? Well, we've got a country of 320 million. It's a tiny little band of people. But that's how you change things in the world. And you guys, each of you, will have in your career an opportunity to be your own little representative of being part of that merry band, to band together and make a huge difference in what you do. And there's kind of a like it or not, you're faced with the challenges. Your generation got handed this. My generation got handed with other things. Your generation has been handed this. It's a hot, crowded, flat world. That's the reality that you're dealing with. Uh, the future of humankind is going to be in the buildings and the cities you shape. Uh, it's an amazing opportunity, and you've got it what it takes to do it. So, okay, you've heard me enough. Get to work. Anybody's got any brain space left? I'd be happy to take questions. So, over the summer, um,
classic example. If you just take a building at a time, it's really easy to have that formula be carried out. Um, and it, it is much harder to have to be um, I could actually spend a while on that and ways to shape that a little bit more. But <coughs> it goes back to the work of you know, that, that we need policies and programs that actually begin to essentially charge Thank you. 
very strange that takes place because I got my solar panel, I tried to spend money to put my solar panels on there, but I under my allowance, you're over your allowance, then you give me some money you pay me because I'm basically uh, helping you with your carbon footprint. So that's kind of how it works. And that's what capital is. And you know, so you know the idea of, of, of uh, you know, kind of unintended consequences. And you know, uh, the, you know th there's also just um, the term of art just flew out of my head. But you know, uh, so what when 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 you are resulting in costs that you're not actually paying for, so they're externalities. Okay? When you have economic externalities, how do you is that cool? You know, so um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll try to use an example that, that's, that's not hard. Okay? So you have a big site, and you grow a bunch of cows on that site. Okay? And it rains. Believe it or not, it rains all the time, and it falls on your ground. Okay? And the water runs off the ground, and it goes into the stream full of all the cow dung and stuff and everything that comes with the cows. Okay, and it leaks the stream and it kills the fish. And the guy down the stream was a fisher and makes his or her living fishing and doesn't have a living to make. So the person polluting the stream the field with the cows, is it okay for that person to have an externality that they're just not responsible for? Them? Is it? Yeah. So so that's the deal. With all of this, the, the whole notion of sort of sustainability and looking at flows, it's you can't have externalities. There is no such thing. There's no way. There's no there. Everything's here. So at some point or another, we have built a system for 150 years of this industrial system that was loaded with externalities. And the more externalities you can do, the, the, the more sort of free ride we got, good for you, fantastic, you know, uh, steel industry totally destroyed the health of everybody in your city by polluting the cheaper set of the air. You don't have to pay for it. Who cares? You know, so, so and, and, you know, I mean, it wasn't even necessarily intentional. It just came with the steel and everybody had jobs and everybody had great living. But look, they all died. So we're just, that, that's sort of the essence of a hot, flat, and crowded world. You know, if there's enough space, you know, et cetera, maybe you don't have to deal with those externalities. But what essentially the new urban agenda is about, and then, and then the Paris Accord, which is a little tiny event, which goes to everybody in Harvard, is there, there are recognitions that externalities can't exist anymore. You have to. So cap and trade is a version of getting rid of the externalities of, uh, you know, of, of carbon. And I actually think uh, I'm, 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 I like I like simple things. I'd rather charge you five dollars a gallon of gas. That what you do. If you really want to fill out forms and pay somebody else and all that kind of stuff, great. But just charge more. Make make natural gas cost sixty. And pay for the pollution that is caused. Why should natural gas be paying for the carbon capture systems to offset the carbon? Why should it? Why is that okay? Why don't we just say, oh yeah, that's okay, for natural gas, no problem? That makes sense. And we can't afford it. We literally, we're destroying the world. We can't afford it. Zero net energy. We're going to be 100% renewables. 
really get to this value equation, really understand how to talk value. And um, so there's a lot of owners today that if you can talk about long-term payback, long-term benefit versus first cost, uh, they'll get it. You can also talk about associated benefits, like and not only will you save money, you know, like so that 71 Garfield Street, the the, the woman who's the developer of that, who's awesome, just amazing person. I mean, somebody who's devoted her life to making other people's lives better. But still, like, okay, green, what has that got to do with her? She's affordable housing. Okay. Well, she sparked to this, she totally woke up to this as a, as an equity thing. You know, it's like, oh God, not only am I going to do affordable housing, I'm going to do this awesome, cool green building that poor people are going to live in. It isn't like the poor people get the shit and the rich people get the cool stuff. I can actually do this affordable housing project that's cool. It's green, it's art, and it's cool. So she was so excited about that. So that, we were able to get her interested in this because she wasn't going to have a utility bill. For an affordable housing project, how cool is that? You're getting your energy for free. Every single apartment unit in that building, that's a couple hundred bucks a month that they're not writing checks for. Okay, So she was blown away by that. And we didn't quite get to zero. We got to about 20%. You know, We got about 80% of that cost down. You know, So instead of having a $200 a month utility bill, they had a $40 a month utility bill for the for those apartments. That, that that talks that talks loud and clear. And you also get green and art equals cool. And these people who are you know are affordable housing people, you know that you know, need rent subsidies and things like that. They're not just getting something. They're getting something cool, and they're all excited about it. They get all that associated. So do that, do that kind of stuff.